Hello. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, why don't we get started? How's everybody doing? I already asked, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're, uh, I'm going to talk about how to improve CI/CD process for your cloud native Python applications using a uh, few different PyPI cloud options. Um, yeah. So let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Jaehan. My friends call me Jay because they cannot pronounce my name correctly. Um, from Boston, so having a hard time getting used to this weather as well. Um, I'm a software engineer at Ikigai. Uh, we're building really cool the data science platform like on the cloud, and we're uh, helping our users who use the, uh, their data on their day-to-day -day life to automate the process. So uh, please come check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, so the motivation of why I'm here is, um, as a startup, we did not spend a lot of time on our um, CSD process or either uh, cloud infrastructure. When we started off, we just wanted to focus on our POC. And our investors are there. We just wanted to make something. So naturally, we didn't focus too much. And now it's a big problem. And then we had to spend a lot of time, waste a lot of resources you know, to build something that is meaningful, something that is, you know, um, uh, uh, it's something that's not breaking. Um, also, we, um, I, I didn't specify here, but also we use a lot of open source tools to make our platform work. For example, uh, Superset is a visualization tool written in Python. And also Ray is a computing engine, which I love. So I always wanted to give back to the open source community, and then I found this opportunity as a perfect example. So yeah, that's why I'm here. So uh, today, I want to talk about uh, wh uh, where we started, like how we start this journey of like setting up uh, cloud infrastructure with PyPI, and what kind of CI/CD challenges we faced on the way, and how we resolved it. And in that CI/CD pro uh, CI processes, we utilized this something called PyPI. Um, and then I'm going to introduce some different types of hosting options for PyPI in your infrastructure. And lastly, I want to talk about some few example cloud architecture that I utilized with uh, utilize PyPI with. And um, yeah, so why don't we get started? So I'm going to start with uh, how we started uh, our uh, building our platform. So in a nutshell, we wanted to build a data science platform at cloud. And I am a big fan of uh, all these tools uh, listed here. We wanted to build our platform on AWS cloud. We wanted to use Python for our language. And for our microservice ecosystem, we wanted to use gRPC. And to containerize our, uh, containerize our application, we utilized Docker. And uh, we wanted to deploy and then orchestrate those containers on Kubernetes. Um, of course, and uh, following, we wanted to build a CICD pipeline that uh, incorporate all these things. So um, I'm going to start by how naive we were. Um, so this is what we thought is going to happen. So for our CI, continuous integration portion, we thought we're going to write Python code. And we're going to build a service. So naturally, Python doesn't really build a service like other languages. But we utilize the gRPC. So we, just, we, uh, we compiled protobuf for services to communicate with each other. And we test, we some, uh, perform some kind of unit test for each services. Uh, if the task passes, we merge to the main branch and containerize. Pretty simple, right? For deployment, also simple. Uh, most of the companies have, most of the product has like two uh, environment, uh, two clusters. Um, either dev or staging environment where they push and test. So exactly that. We're going to push to our development Kubernetes cluster. We run a uh, platform test so that uh, we to see if services can play good with each other, and which is also written in PyTest, uh, Python. And we then deploy to production environment. And then we test one more time a platform test to see everything's perfect. So. Um, as our platform grows, our company grows, we have a lot of feature requests. So we build multiple services on top of it. So I'm going to quickly explain like what these are, because I'm going to use this example until the end of the talk. So API server is basically what users interact with. It's um, like, hey, where is my project? Where is the like, list of the model that I can use? Um, things like that. Etail services. Uh, pay, um, the data pipeline, they run the data pipeline. They perform basic ETL steps, like a filter, sample, all these things, and deliver the data so that ML service can utilize. And ML service, of course, build a machine learning model with hyperparameters and uh, persist it in somewhere, uh, all the goodness. Um, so what we thought, what we expected is, 
if we have multiple services, we're going to just do, uh, replicate the in, entire pipeline and then just build it. And then it's going to be, uh, it's going to be nice. It's going to be clean, all independent, great. So obviously, that was not the case. So I'm going to introduce some obvious CI/CD challenges. So first one was a shared code base. Uh, as a startup, we didn't plan it right. So um, this ML, por ML model portion of the code base was embedded in every single services, and that's not good. Because so example-wise, uh, API server wants to get all the list of model that it should return to users. So it calls some part of the models, uh, model portion of the code base. ETL service wanted to uh, pre-process the data um, that is specific to each model, so it had to uh, access that. And then ML, uh, ML service, of course, has to build a model, so it needs to access to that uh, model code base. So it was really tangled up like this, and um, this was the problem because every time you want to change something in the library, for example, let's say you added one type of machine learning models to this model portion of the code base. Now you want to expose that to user, hey, there's a new model, and now you want to um, run some pre-processing in ETL pipeline when that model was requested by users, and then now you want to build that model in the ML service, meaning you need to trigger entire pipeline again. Like, so you need to build three images just for this, and then when your service scales, like, you don't want to even think about it. So easy, simple, um, natural solution is you just port that out. So code base-wise, you're going to port all the ML model portion of it, uh, code base into a different repository so that you're managing them separately, not embedded in each other. Um, so um, I'm going to use terminology package and library interchangeably in this talk, so I'm going to just make sure that uh, uh, everybody's tracking. So library is just nothing but collection of packages, in my understanding. And package, if you see, uh, if you have uh, played with Python before, if you see one directory with uh, init file in it, and there's a bunch of Python file, and then you can import that, uh, what is it, directory as one logical group, that's a package, right? Um, so library, so in my understanding, it has more of a purpose. Like they, um, you bring them together, and then you give them purpose, it's a reusable, and that's like, that's a library. So in that sense, we separate the model library out from each code bases, and diagram-wise, this looks perfect, this looks independent. So are we good now? So not really, because you differentiated, you like ported out the code base itself, but CICD process is still very, very tightly coupled. So for services, yes, you can write code, you build it, uh, you compile the protobuf, test it out, this same thing you did from before. But still, when you change something in the library, you still have to go through the service portion of it one more time, because yes, you separate out the uh, code base, but you still have to embed it into the service itself so that they can utilize it. So this is not good. So why is it bad? Uh, we still need to re-deliver services when library updates is required. So that's what I just said. And hard to keep track of the library versions within each service version. So what this means is that every time you build a library, yes, it's going to be good. It's going to be ideal if you just build all the services that utilize this library at the same time. But Let's say API server has no problem. It returns all the list of models just fine. But then maybe one of the model has a bug in its pre-processing function. So you just have to update that. Now you have different versions of this ML model library in three different, repo uh, three different location. And then if some bugs happen, you just don't know if you just want to fire out everything or like, yeah. So it's really hard to optimize because you just physically cannot keep track of the version there. So what I want to say is like decoupling is still required at CICD level for that purpose. So wanted to quickly introduce what Python package repository is. So if you use Python before, you know this. So PyPI is classic uh, Python package repository. It holds different types of package that user uploaded. You can download the package easily, pip install. That If you just do pip install something, you're downloading from public PyPI. And um, you can also specify the version. I'm pretty sure you guys know. So if you do pip install ml library equal equal 001, you're just downloading that version. So you don't have to, yeah, I mean, yeah. So with this Python package repository, let's say we have some stable version of hosted solution for this somewhere. So what we're going to do for the library is a um, little different. So we write the library code. We test it out with the unit test. We merge it to the main branch. We build the library into some 
um, portable format like .will or uh, uses Zipit. And you deploy the library, uh, deploy the library to the Python package repository. Simple as that. So now it's version, and then it's, it's accessible for anybody. And now for services, um, it looks a little different because it utilizes the Python package repository in its entire CI/CD pipeline now. So I'm going to walk through. Uh, write, you write service code, you compile the protobuf, and then when you're testing service, now to fully test how service works, like what it can do, you need. Uh, sometimes you have dependency on the libraries, right? And that's when you pull in, you download some specific version of the ML model library that you want to test the compatibility with. So on that spot, you download it and you merge the code, which is not related to ML library now. You containerize a service. And also when you're deploying to the staging environment or some kind of cluster, in your startup code, you're going to download that specific version of the library on the startup. Let me explain like, why that's useful later. Um, but yeah, that's what you're going to do. When you're testing it, uh, you don't necessarily have to download it one more time because it's already inside of the package running as a server. So you do the platform testing, and you do the same thing when you're pushing to the production environment and test it out. So why is this useful? So this is like one example of how we're doing it. So we're setting ML library version as an environment variable for each pod or de uh, deployment in our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So let's say, the, going back to that specific use case where there was a bug in ETL pipeline function. So in ML service, they don't have to update anything. Um, so they're still utilizing ML library version as a 002, but ETL service wanted to update something, so they, now they're using 005. And this is um, maintained in the startup level, the launching uh, launch, script, uh, launch script level, sorry. So when you want to build a library and then when you want to just fix the library and push the change, you don't have to rebuild each container. You just have to restart the pod after you specify which version you want to use with the library. So yeah. And in this way, your um, library version, compatibility between ML service and ML library version is specified inside of the code base. So for you, it's easier to keep, uh, keep up with if you're using GitOps or something. So is, uh, is that it then? Like it's a pretty simple topic, but no. So this is all, so we can decouple CAC processes between libraries and services if we have a Python package repository that is stable and always running. Um, so which is, why I, which is what I will actually want to focus in this talk is a Python package index, uh, PyPI in short. So I'm gonna introduce you a few different ways that you can utilize PyPI in your cloud architecture. So before I start, uh, how I want to measure, uh, this is a good PyPI um, hosted solution for your, uh, for your system is I want to see if it is a cloud native. Um, this is from CNCF website. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is, uh, there's a credential for this. Um, so uh, what I want to focus is that to be cloud native technology, yeah, it should be able to empower organization to build and run scalable application in modern dynamic environment. So dynamic, it should be uh, your PyPI solution should be able to run in any environment. Loosely coupled systems that are resilient, it should be available all the time. And allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently, so pretty much like it has to be fast as well. So these are a few requirements that I set up for a few different options that I'm gonna introduce uh, how you manage your PyP, uh, PyPI server. Um, so first one is portability. Should, uh, you should be able to put your PyPI hosted solution anywhere uh, within your system. And security, I just added it because um, well, you don't want uh, everybody to see your code base on time. Um, resiliency, it should be always available. Speed, it should be fast. Pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna talk about public PyPI first, um, just because. So public PyPI is, well, public PyPI. It, it, this is where you download your stuff if you just pip and stole something. Gonna spend really quick time on it. Security, nothing. Uh, everybody can see what you upload. Everybody can download everything. So. If you uh, want to use anything that is specific to your company environment, anything proprietary, then this is not an option. So resiliency, yes. Uh, portability, yes. To be yes, this uses CDN. So I mean, if your code base is, can be public, if you're working on open source, sure, use uh, pip, but then that's not why I'm here. 
So we're going to explore different options. So uh, PyPI server. So PyPI server is, well, as, it's, uh, as it says, self-hosted PyPI service. So you're hosting this in your specific environment, and then those packages are going to be available just for you, right? Um, uh, this is open source. Uh, go check it out. But this is how PyPI server generally works. It has some kind of a disk space. And if you upload a package, it's going to be stored as a directory. And each directory represents the packages there. And inside of there, you're going to find either ag file or either um, will file, which is like compiled version of your Python uh, code. Um, and it's versioned inside of each directory. So in Kubernetes, if you want to make the very dumb version of it, you launch up your Py, uh, PyPI server pod or as a deployment. And you hook it up to some kind of storage, which is a persistent volume, and then, so that when pod dies for some extreme event, you're, you don't lose all the packages, of course. So that's one way in Kubernetes. If you want to make it in, in um, AWS, then you launch up EC2 machine, you install PyPI server there, or run the container that has a PyPI server there, uh, mount an EBS volume on it so that you can keep your packages in, uh, at, uh, in the event of PyPI server just dies. So yeah, pretty simple um, diagram here. So the problem is it does have a little bit of scaling issue if your company is big and then there's a lot of people working on it. So every time when you do pip install, what it does is it sends the HTTP request to the PyPI server, that the pod or EC2 instance. And every single time when that happens, it scans entire disk space. So if you have actually thousands of packages, it slows down a lot. Like, it's, you might have to wait for a few minutes just to install one package, and I don't think you want that. Um, I mean, that's initializing the installment, not just actually installing it. Once it finds the package, installing is pretty fast. But like that, just f searching for the package itself takes a lot of time. So what you can do is you can actually install the caching, uh, PyPI, ser uh, PyPI server cache, uh, manually in your PyPI server. It actually remembers every time when you um, when some package is um, uh, updated or uh, requested, it remembers where, that, uh, where uh, the location of each PyPI package, and then it immediately returns. So that's one way you can actually speed it up a lot. Uh, PyPI server cache it internally uses a watchdog py uh, Python library. It just monitors the file changes, and that's how they maintain the caching of like, where this package is. What you can, and if you want to do more, you can actually enable caching at the reverse proxy level. Like Nginx has a innate in a reverse, uh, what is it? Um, Built-in caching logic, so you can utilize that too. If you want to see how that actually works, you can go to the reference on the bottom. But yeah, so you can resolve the scaling issue by doing this, kind of manual. So I'm going to do a little bit of demo. I'm going to drink some water really quick. <laughs> So this is a, just a pi, uh, public repo that I made for this specific demo, so please check it out. But what I'm going to do here, I have a PyPI server, and I have three directories set up. Uh, set up is how to set up your basic Kubernetes um, PyPI server um, in your own Kubernetes uh, cluster. I set it, set it up already because I hate live demo. It always it doesn't work. So. I'm going to do that. And upload is how you can upload your own package. And download is how you can, well, download the package is pretty simple. Try to uh, be very descriptive on like, how each thing works. So let me know if, if you cannot follow. So OK, let me go through this one first. So uh, what happens is you, uh, to deploy the PyPI server by yourself, you uh, add the Helm repo. And you need to generate the user, encode the username and password with uh, HT password D. Um, this creates the file that has your user information, and then you're embedding this when you're building, uh, when you're starting up the PyPI server. So PyPI server remembers your username and password, and then only enable you to download something if you authenticate yourself. Pretty simple. Um, what I did is I have a kind local cluster. Um, I created a namespace PyPI server, and I deployed my Py, uh, PyPI server Helm chart. So in here, uh, it only has a replica count one. I'm going to explain why I just have one, even though it's a Kubernetes setup. 
And this is what I put as a credential. My uh, credential is test user and password is a test password. So, yeah, so this is already running. I deployed it already. Um, restarted once because I updated the Docker. And what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the port forwarding for this so that I can uh, access the PyPS server in the pod with my local host. So that's exactly the pod uh, that is running here. So if I go to local host, you're gonna see this pipe, uh, PyPI server. It's very small, PyPI server. Um, doesn't have too pretty UI, but so if I go to simple index, this is a, a default index that uh, if you don't specify any other index and don't create anything by yourself, simple is where you're gonna go. So I deployed this cloud open before this talk and it has two versions, 001 and 002. So as I said, there's a, direct, a disk space with a bunch of directories in it and each directory, uh, what is it? Each directory represents one package, and inside of there, you're gonna find binaries for each, pack, uh, each versions of that library, right? Um, I can download this by doing this. So I'm gonna quickly show. So I made this really nothing uh, package called Cloud Open, so I'm gonna Actually, let me upload it first, sorry. So if I go to upload, this is how you, I'm pretty sure people, uh, if you have published something into a public PyPI, you know this, but just wanted to quickly go over. So dot PyPRC, this is the file that keeps track of which PyPI, uh, PyPI server that your computer remembers. And you can specify uh, uh, different types of servers here. If you put test and then like next up like development, you just have to add another field that looks exactly like this. This is where you uh, where your PyPI server is located, uh, password and username. So you have to put this in your home directory, just like uh, .aws file, and you specify the setup.py file. You know, um, specify the name of your package and you specify the requirements, like just like requirements.txt, and version, I'm gonna specify that with the, the, the bash's environment variable. And how I build it, build and deploy, is I call the function, I uh, invoke the function, invoke the file, module, and upload it to repository that I specify. So obviously I'm gonna use test. So if I do PyPI server, Go to upload. If I do Python, oh no, sorry, bash. So we had 002 version, I think. So I'm gonna upload 003 and to the test. It's pretty fast, because I have nothing there. So if I refresh, you're gonna see your version there, right? Um, downloading is also very simple. Because you're not downloading from your public PyPI, where you don't have to specify anything else. You do have to specify something called index URL. That's where your own PyPI server is located. So I'm going to copy and paste this one more time. And I'm going to change the test username, uh, username and password to test user and test password. And let me download 002, although there's absolutely no difference between the version. Oop. Cloud open 002. Let me just download Cloud open for now. Okay. This is why I hate it. Uh, Localhost. Oh. Oh, there you go. Okay. <sighs> okay. So, so Cloud Open, so obviously this is the latest version, uh, so I download that. Let me retry this. So, I have this. I'm gonna download the 002 version. 
Thank you for waiting. Yeah, so you can do the version control like this, obviously. And just to make sure that you download everything correctly, so in cl import cloud open and cloud open greet, it does its thing. So now your computer has a package from your own PyPI server. So um, that's good. Moving back to the slide. So other option uh, other than PyPI cloud, which we're using in our company is uh, PyPI server, is PyPI, uh, PyPI cloud. So think of this as a yet another way of hosting your private PyPI server, but you're making your caching layer and you're making your storage layer into a hosted service. So small teams like us just loves this because we don't have to put much time into it. So in the storage layer, um, you can use Amazon S3, uh, GC, uh, GCS, uh, Azure Blob Storage. For caching layer, you can use Dynamo. We're using Dynamo any kind of a Redis um, distribution, any kind of a SQL library, a SQL database, sorry. I just put Postgres there because I love Postgres. And because these things are a hosted service now, or can be hosted service now, um, you can literally put PyPI uh, Pi Cloud instance anywhere. Like if it is Kubernetes or if it is like some, if you wanna use it in Heroku, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so another demo is, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do much this time because it's pretty much the same. Um, I'm gonna go to PyPI Cloud and go to Setup. So in this case, we're gonna actually build a Docker image or I, or I built a Docker image and deploy that. All that information is here. If you go to Docker file, I have that. And then we're gonna explore how to change the server.ini file really quick. But so just like you create a password in PyPI server, you're gonna to have to create a password here as well. But instead of using HT password D, uh, you're gonna uh, you're gonna use uh, PyPI Cloud's um, own uh, executable PPC Gen password. Once you uh, use that, it's gonna ask you password twice, and it just looks like password dot. So it looks like a max password thing. So I was uh, inputting my password for like 10 minutes and noticed I was dumb. And yeah, so what you're gonna do is you're in that server.ini file, uh, you're gonna specify what user you're gonna use. I still use a test user, and this is that encoded version of task password. Um, and you're gonna specify what storage backend you wanna use. So we're using S3, uh, we're using Dynamo for this demo. And if you provide your pod, your PyPI cloud instance, enough credentials, for example, I gave, um, uh, AWS uh, access keys and secret key to our pod and then it auto generates all this for you. So you don't have to do anything by yourself, pretty easy. And then I build a Docker image locally and I create a PyPI cloud namespace and I deploy with the Helm chart. So I'm gonna do yet another for porting. So this is where that uh, PyP PyPI cloud deployment is. I'm gonna do that. If I go to localhost one more time, so now it's a PyPI cloud. Looks better, I think. It has nothing because you need to log in. So test user, test password. And it's gonna take you to, oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God. The cloud open with better UI. So I only uploaded one uh, package here. How to upload, how to download is exactly the same with the PyPI server. I mean, PyPI server's way of uh, uploading is exactly the same with the public PyPI as well. So not gonna go through that one more time. So that's PyPI Cloud. So I wanna kind of compare PyPI Cloud and PyPI server really quick. So PyPI server, portability, yes, you can, uh, use, uh, you can deploy that inside of the Kubernetes as a pod. You can deploy it in, in EC2, so you can pretty much do whatever you want. Security, yeah, if you put this in your own VPC, yeah, you have your security and it's a little plus, you have a username and password. It doesn't do much, but still there. Resiliency, so you need to do a little bit of work for this. I'm gonna show you with the diagram how we achieve this uh, in the next slide. But what happens is, if you want to, so in Kubernetes, I'm gonna just keep using Kubernetes as my example. If you wanna have multiple path for availability and resiliency, um, in PyPI server, you need to mount that to the disk. If you want to mount multiple pods into uh, one disk in Kubernetes, you need your PVC, your persistent volume claim, has to have a read-write-many access mode. 
And you kind of have to have an NFS that's there for you if you want to mount it, uh, mount from different, uh, many different parts. So for us, it was a little bit more work than we expected. So it would work, but Resilius is going to be there. Speed, yes. If you install that caching thing by yourself, uh, you're going to get speed as well. So PyPI Cloud, portability, security, exactly the same thing with PyPI, uh, PyPI Server. So yes, it's there. Uh, the beautiful thing about PyPI Cloud is resiliency and speed just follows uh, follow with it. So storage, since you're using S3, GCS, this hosted solution, you don't have to worry about like setting up your NFS server or something like that. And speed, uh, caching layer is default here, so you automatically get speed without doing anything by yourself. So yeah, uh, next up we're gonna talk about like these, I'm gonna introduce three different types of cloud architecture that you can host your own PyPI uh, Py Py server. And I actually use this, um, all, use all of this in my current company and my previous company. So we're gonna start with what I used the, uh, in the past. Um, so we had PyPI server, two instances, uh, multiple instances of PyPI server uh, in EC2. And we did have multiple Kubernetes cluster. I believe most of the companies, other companies do as well, because blue green or staging production. I'm gonna just set this as a default option now. Um, so we have a multiple PyPI server uh, that talks to each cluster, uh, and for resiliency, it doesn't have to connect uh, strictly with this guy and this guy. Um, and each PyPI server, EC2 instances are um, mounted to EBS block, where we actually store all the packages there. The problem, not the problem, but then, so EBS does allow you to mount multiple EC2 machines, but I think the limit is like 16 machines at this time, and then you kind of have to be in same availability zone to, uh, for that to happen. So for us, a little too much work, and then we can see the limitation when we started off, so I didn't want to use it um, next time I'll set it up. So the next time I set it up in the current company, uh, we start with this. We actually um, have use PyPI server in a pod, and each of those pods were uh, mounted to EFS, which is a, a kind of NFS service that um, Amazon provide. And PVC, uh, of course, it has to be read-write many. We noticed there was some little slowdown issue for some reason in EFS like 2016, so we stopped using it, so we installed Ceph, and it was beautiful, but then it was a little too much work just for this. So uh, we decided to explore other options. Uh, even though this was working totally fine, uh, we wanted to make something, uh, we wanted to explore something that is simpler to manage. And that's why, that's how we ended up with PyPI Cloud. So as you can see, the diagram is like a lot simpler now. You can deploy your PyPI Cloud pod in deployment, stateful, set, uh, what is it, replica set, demon said whatever, into the, each Kubernetes cluster and they all connect to DynamoDB. I don't have to worry about the scalability and they just do it. So, yeah, um, and then with this setup, our infra team didn't have to revisit, hey, uh, this is not working for uh, our PyPI cloud deployment for last half a year. We didn't really worry about it, so I think that's a really big win for a startup like us. So yeah, just putting that idea out there. So in conclusion, by using PyPI Cloud, we can organize code base with libraries and services without sacrificing efficiency. So not just separating your code base out, but then your CI CD pipeline can be uh, more individualized for each services and library. Um, so host scalable and secure, uh, secure Python package repository for your cloud native environment. So I kind of suggested two different options, PyPI server and cloud. So um, if you, um, if your company has specific infrastructure already running, try to find what's best suiting you. And then lastly, engineers can focus on building interesting stuff rather than wasting your time on setting something that is always breaking. Really, yeah. But yeah, thank you. That's everything I wanted to say. Thank you for coming. If you have any other question, I'm gonna stay around for the next few minutes, so feel free to talk to me. Thank you.